Today's video is brought to you by Cars and Bids, my online enthusiast car auction site that recently sold this and this and this and this and this. Check it out at carsandbids.com. This is the new 2024 Ferrari 296 GTB, and it's a bit of a surprise, actually, because it has a hybrid V6. That's a big deal, because for years, Ferraris in this market segment have had a big, screaming V8. Thankfully, it's okay, because this car has 819 horsepower. Today, I'm going to review the 296 GTB, and show you all of its quirks and features. All right, time for the quirks and features of the 296 GTB. Starting with a little overview. This is Ferrari's newest entry-level mid-engine sports car. Now, it's not Ferrari's entry-level model. That's the Portofino and the Roma, which are cheaper than this. They're front-engine V8 kind of touring cars. But in terms of focused mid-engine sports cars, this is where it starts in the Ferrari realm. And the 296 is just the latest in a long lineage that includes cars like the F430 and the 458 and the 360. Ferraris for decades, the 296 continues the lineup and replaces the Ferrari F8. Now, there's two versions of the 296. There's the coupe this car, which is called the GTB, and then there's the convertible, which is called the 296 GTS. And pricing, as you might imagine, is pretty stout. $350,000 starting price for this car, the coupe, and figure three seventy-five dollars or three eighty-five thousand dollars starting price for the convertible. And then options take things significantly higher from there. The good news, though, is that all that money buys you you a truly beautiful car. I have been critical of Ferrari models since they split from Pininfarina, the famed Italian design house that used to design their cars. But this is the most beautiful Ferrari since that split. Absolutely gorgeous. From the rear three quarters, you can see some 250 LM, one of the most famous Ferrari models of all time. From the front, you can see a little bit of Enzo. It looks modern and daring and special, but not over overstyled and excessive. It's just clean enough. It is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful modern Ferrari models. Absolutely a gorgeous car. If there's any drawback to the way this looks, and there isn't, it's the fact that, frankly, the 296 looks better than the SF90, which is Ferrari's more expensive mid-engine model. Those are like $750,000, but this car is half the money and more attractive. And frankly, the performance is about the same or maybe a little better too. You can imagine which one I would get. Regardless, beautiful car. And then there's the engine, which has been the big news, the big deal, and frankly, the big controversy about this car. It's a turbocharged six-cylinder that's mated to a plug-in hybrid powertrain. And it's referenced in the name. 296 stands for 2.9 liter six-cylinder. Although actually this is a three liter engine, 296, that's where it comes from. Now, this is technically the first Ferrari road car ever Ever to have a six-cylinder engine. Back in the 70s, the Dino had a six-cylinder, but that wasn't technically branded a Ferrari. It was supposed to be a separate mark that was going to get spun off, and so this is the very first six-cylinder road car, and that has caused some controversy. People think Ferrari should just be V8s and V12s. Well, the 296 is here to change minds, and it certainly delivers the numbers on paper. Eight 119 horsepower. That is the actual figure for this car. It's comprised of the gasoline engine, which makes 654 horsepower on its own, and then combine that with the plug-in hybrid system for another 165 horsepower to get to 819. 
all 296 models are rear wheel drive. So it's a lot of power going through two wheels and they all have a dual clutch automatic transmission and an 8,500 RPM redline. And of course, the performance numbers are astonishing. Zero to 60 in under three seconds, top speed of 205 miles an hour. And in case you wanna be economical, Ferrari says it'll do about 15 miles in pure electric mode with no gas engine at all. But anyway, there's your 296 overview. Let's go through its interesting quirks and features, starting with this engine, which is under a big piece of tinted glass in the back of the car. You open up the glass and reveal the powertrain and lots of it. And it's cool to see that it still looks, well, cool. Even though it's not a V8, you got the Ferrari script and a little plaque with your vehicle number, and it still looks like a special and exciting engine bay that you would be proud to show off even if it doesn't have eight or 12 cylinders. Now, a few interesting items worth noting back here. For one, the rear spoiler. This car doesn't have an obvious one in the back and nothing lifts up when you go a certain speed. Instead, it's here in the middle between the passenger compartment and the engine. That's where you can see the air flows under and that's your spoiler that's intended to create downforce. It helps keep the design clean without some spoiler sticking up and ruining things. Also interesting, in back is the center exit exhaust, which has kind of a cool look to it, and the taillights, which you can see are very thin, not big circles like Ferraris in the past, sort of a more modern, updated version of that design. The taillights don't really do anything strange in terms of lighting patterns or dances, but they do have a distinctive look. Up front, one interesting item is this, which is a little carbon fiber piece kind of stuck on the front diffuser, presumably to aid in aerodynamics. I'm sure Ferrari has greatly tested it and found it makes the car point two seconds faster around the Fiorano test track. But there it is, an interesting element of the 296 that I can't recall seeing on other cars. Now, one other thing that's worth noting on the outside of this car, the wheels. This design is absolutely beautiful, but if you're trying to maximize the lightness of this car for top track times, you can get carbon fiber wheels that obviously are lighter than these standard aluminum ones. Not sure how much they cost or how much weight they save, but they're available for the serious driver. As for getting inside, the key is very unusual. It is this, just a rectangle with the Ferrari logo. <laughs> You flip it over and the rear is leather. There aren't really buttons there, but instead just areas where you press to lock or unlock the doors. You press twice on unlock to open the front trunk. It's a very minimalist key except for the giant color Ferrari logo. Now, there's no spot on this key to hook it onto a key ring. It's supposed to stand alone by itself. And speaking of getting into the 296, another unusual aspect is the door handles, which are certainly non-traditional. You walk up and, well, they're part of the body. You push in in the door handle area and then the doors pop open and you can open them up the rest of the way and climb inside. And next up, we move inside the 296, where I discover that it's actually a little bit tight in here. I think that taller drivers will be surprised to discover it's a little cramped inside this car, particularly compared to previous Ferrari models. It feels like it has a little less room. That's especially true in terms of legroom. The lower dash seems to come down a little bit lower and intrude into the footwell a little more. And headroom is also a bit tight. It feels a little smaller in here than I was expecting. But let's go through all of the many quirks and features of this car's interior. So you get in and sit down and engine start stop is glowing at you on the steering wheels. You can see on a little button screen. You press that and well, it turns on a lot of other screens. That's a theme in this interior. And we'll start with the screens on the steering wheel. Yes, the steering wheel itself has them. To the left of the start stop button, you have this little H, which stands for hybrid. If you tap over there, it allows you to choose between four different drive modes. You have hybrid, which I guess is default, and then there's ED for E-Drive. There's also a performance mode and a qualify mode for racetrack driving. Now, on the right side of the steering wheel, this switch allows you to choose between, well, more drive modes. You have race, sport, wet, and a traction control off mode for all-out performance driving. So you can make all your 
your drive mode adjustments on the wheel, and you can make basically every other adjustment on the steering wheel as well. You have your headlights over on the left side. You can see here your high beams, and then the switch above that controls the regular headlights themselves. On the right, you have your windshield wipers. You can turn them on and off with the buttons and switches on the steering wheel. Behind the wheel, you have your shift paddles to change gear, of course, and your radio controls to change the station or the track, and then also your radio volume. And you even have your turn signals mounted right here on the steering wheel. No signal stock. You just tap this with your thumb and the turn signal turns on. Now, the theory here is that by keeping all of your controls on the steering wheel, you won't have to be reaching around to change stuff when you're in high performance driving situations like the racetrack. Everything is literally at your fingertips. And I mean everything. This little button with a seat and a snowflake lets you adjust the climate control from your steering wheel. No more reaching into the center to change the temperature, the setting. You can do it on the wheel, which is so cool. More cars need to have steering wheel adjustable climate control, and it's neat to see that this one does. Now, next to that button for the climate control, you have a separate button screen situation marked View Max. You push that, and it adjusts the gauge cluster screen to show a different display. The first one shows a full screen map directly in front of you, which is cool to see. You can look down and see exactly where you're going in large, easy to read full screen. You press it again, and there's sort of a hybrid between a full screen map and some vehicle information you might want while you're driving. You press it again and go back to the default screen, which is the main kind of home screen of this gauge cluster that shows an enormous amount of information. In fact, it's so much information because this is the primary infotainment screen in this car. There's no center screen like in basically every other vehicle. Instead, it's all right here. The music you're listening to, the map showing you where you're going, obviously performance stuff like your speed, your RPM. And then on the right side, you can see a configurable menu that lets you choose whatever else you want to see. And there's a lot more info around here as well when you look around. The temperature, the miles till empty, all of this stuff is right here on this main infotainment screen, which is only accessible to the driver. The passenger can't do it. Instead, the only screen in the middle is this climate control screen, still angled towards the driver, but usable by the passenger. And of course, the driver can use it too when not controlling things on the steering wheel. However, before you go thinking that the passenger has been completely forgotten about in this car, check it out. The passenger has their own screen as well. On their side of the dashboard, the passenger gets a little touch screen that controls all sorts of vehicle functions. The passenger can change the stereo, media, radio from this screen. Also, the navigation system. They can see a map or enter a destination if they want. And the passenger can even monitor performance data from this screen without looking over to the driver's screen to see how fast you're going. It's right here on the passenger screen. So two separate infotainment system <laughs> screens in the 296. And the screen stuff isn't done just yet. To the left of the steering wheel, you have another little button pad screen that allows you to control the power mirrors on the outside of the car and also the headlights and the axle lift all controlled here with these button screens instead of traditional physical buttons. But aside from the screens, beyond all that, what are the other interesting quirks and features of this interior? Well, let's go to the center console where you have the most obvious one. Well, first there's the window switches, as you can see, and the hazard lights. But in the middle, you have this little group of switches that's intended to look like an old school gated manual transmission. It's a retro design <laughs> inspired by the gated manual, but it's just a few switches that control things. Over on the left, you pull this switch down and you go into reverse. And you can see a little light that pulses toward the R to confirm that input. In the middle, you have A and M for automatic and manual, the transmission modes. And then on the right, there's a selection called PS, which stands for power start 
Ferrari's words for launch control, all in your retro-themed shifter switch panel in the center console. Now, moving further down, you have a rectangle here. You might recognize the size of this rectangle. It matches the key. When you get in the car, you don't have a place for the key. You can put it right here so it's on display for you while you drive around. Also here in the center console, you have your charge ports. You can plug in your devices here, hook them up to the car to charge, or to go into the infotainment system. And behind the seats, you have a little bit of storage back here, including a cargo net for some stuff if you want it in the car, but you don't want it to roll around. As for actual physical real buttons in this car, there aren't really all that many, and the majority of them are found on the door. This one here, you push to get out. Instead of a door handle, press this and you can open up the door. The other buttons here also control other popping things. The fuel pump, press that. Of course, it opens the fuel door. You can also open the charge door here, and the last button opens the front trunk that, of course, you can use for storage. And and finally, let's move into the front trunk to check it out. Open it up and you discover it's surprisingly large. There is a good amount of space here where you can stick a good amount of luggage in case you wanted to use your 296 for a weekend getaway or frankly, even longer than that. Now, also located in the trunk, for one thing, this plaque on the back side of the trunk area that shows all of the options that you have specifically selected for your 296, plus it shows the exact serial number of your car. It's a very personalized, special plaque that makes you feel good every time you get in here. You also have a few other goodie bags, as you can see. To the left, this zippered pouch labeled Ferrari 296 GTB. That's your toolkit. Open it up, and there's a few tools in there that might be useful to help do basic servicing on your car although no one will. Over on the right, this zippered pouch that says Ferrari, that's your tire inflator kit. And in the middle, this larger zippered pouch is your charging cables for when you want to charge the plug-in hybrid drivetrain. All right, driving the 296. Been very excited about this. Car's been very well reviewed and I'm interested to see for myself. Oh boy, is this car something special. So let's start with powertrain. Oh, no, it does not have the sound of a V8. There's absolutely no doubt about that, but it has the pull. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> this car is such a weapon. It is so unbelievably fast. It is so unbelievably quick to handle. This car is truly, truly amazing in a way that is honestly challenging to describe. But from a powertrain perspective, it is incredibly responsive and incredibly linear. You hear about a hybrid, you hear about turbochargers, you hear about a six cylinder, you're not really sure how that's gonna be compared to an NAV8, which is something you know and love and you know is gonna be quick and you know is gonna be responsive and torquey. Well, this feels like an NAV8 in terms of the way that it responds. You press the throttle even the littlest bit and it is ready to go and it is just so unbelievably fast to respond to your basically every input. I'm astonished. Oh. Oh. oh, it's so fast. Wow. I am astonished by the speed and performance of this car. I am astonished by the responsiveness of this powertrain. There is no compromise from a performance perspective getting this engine instead of a V8. And honestly, it feels a lot faster than a 458, which was the last V8 Ferrari that was made in this kind of Ferrari market segment. This is an incredibly fast, incredibly thrilling car. Oh, flooring the accelerator in this car is a massive undertaking. You will go forward at a tremendous rate. I mean, it feels like an electric car, honestly. It feels like the really fast electric cars, which, you know, sometimes I wonder, are we ever gonna see gas powered cars that are, you know, even on that level anymore? Well, the answer is yes, this one. I mean, you look at the numbers and you know it's gonna be fast, but this is 
mongo fast. The handling of this car is incredible because it is completely flat, has perfect weight distribution, and is incredibly predictable around corners. You just feel like you have the ability to just give it as much power as you want, and it will totally be there and hug the road. That's true of a lot of modern supercars and sports cars. The thing that really sets this one apart is the steering is just so precise. Immediacy, incredible immediacy with the inputs of the steering. You make a quick input and you're instantly going in that direction. There's a lot of thought that has to be paid to everything you do in this car because it is an immediate car. If you floor the accelerator, you're gone very fast. If you turn the steering wheel, woo, you turn very fast. This car is just an, in, it's, I, I don't want to call it twitchy, but it is precise. You had better be ready to operate this vehicle because it is ready to do whatever you tell it to and it's gonna do it fast. Oh. So incredibly quick and powerful. I, I'm astonished. I'm astonished at the steering and handling. I'm astonished at the power, the performance. This car is really at the very top level of everything. Just really, really excessively impressive and insane. Now, the engine sound is definitely a drawback, although it's not as bad as I thought. I was, I was afraid of what a V6 hybrid Ferrari would sound like. It actually sounds okay. It's definitely not an NA V8 but it's, it has a pretty good sound to it. Other than that, there's no real complaints about this car. Yeah, I wish it had a manual transmission. That would be cool. They should do a manual version of this car and make a lot of money doing it, like a limited production manual version. They should. They don't, I don't know why. But if you just take this car at face value, the performance level, the handling, the steering, the feel, it is one of the great exotic sports cars that I've ever driven. It is just capable of doing anything at any time and very easily. It is a magnificent work of impressive engineering and art that this car has so much performance. It really is an incredible thing. Your only real drawback is that you lose that V8 noise from before, but the performance level makes up for it and it's, it's, it's astonishing. It's just really fast. And so that's the new Ferrari 296 GTB. Yes, it has a V6, but you won't care when you look at it because it's beautiful and you won't care when you drive it because it's magnificent. <laughs> And now it's time to give the 296 GTB a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 72 out of 100, which places the 296 GTB here against rivals ahead of all of them. It's also notable that the 296 has the very first 10 out of 10 in this group for styling against the Huracans and the Arturas and the 48s and the F8s. This is the most beautiful, at least to me. The 296 is a truly amazing car, and I think it's one of the best Ferrari models in recent memory. Even though it's not a low volume special car, it's an excellent execution in terms of performance design and quality.